Hello everyone. Um, this subject is a, a specialist interest of mine, initially because I was uh, frustrated how f few postgraduate students, particularly those engaging with non-medical prescribing study, could actually grasp this concept. And more recently, I've tried innovative ways to get fresher students to get used to the idea, get it part of their mindset that they must work in partnership with their patients. I'm very flattered to be invited to speak here today because I can virtually guarantee you that everyone in this room knows more about tissue viability than I do. And that includes the technicians. Um, but I have worked very hard and read a bit to try and, and spoken to the right people to try and make relevant application. So please do keep your rotten tomatoes until the last. Um, I'd want to cut to the chase here. Um, I'm not somebody who argues about words, even though I publish a lot and do all the things academics are supposed to do. I think this is probably the exception that proves the rule, because I've never seen so much confusion about terminology. And I actually believe it is more important what you do than what you call what you do. But like I say, I think this is the exception. This word compliance, as an external examiner, I am shocked to find so many student nurses still using this in some very high-powered essays. It is an out-of-date, illegal term, and it f frequently punctuates pharmacology journals, pharmacology textbooks, and not a few government policies. It's out of date. It means that the patient should do as they're told because the professional knows best. Uh, the patient behaviour should match the practitioner expectations and directions. Now we've moved up the scale a little bit. This word adherence. Now, about seven years ago, NICE, and you can't get much nearer to God than them, published a very useful uh, pathway um, showing a practitioner who knew nothing about concordance how to genuinely work with their patients in partnership. And I actually thought it was an excellent document. The only thing that was wrong with it was the title. It was called Medicine's Adherence. Now, Medicine's Adherence is not concordance. Adherence means that once you've satisfactorily informed the patient, they should do as they're told, because you know best. Finally, we arrive at the real thing, and that's concordance, which is an egalitarian relationship I thought I'd throw a few big words around to impress you. Um, it is an equal partnership leading to an agreed plan between the patient and the practitioner. And this is where we should be. Now, partly because um, half the health professionals around the world didn't really understand concordance, and partly be because they were all using different words. Americans call it collaborative treatment planning. Um, we came up with something a bit simpler called shared decision making. But I want to, shared decision making's fantastic. Excuse me, mouse drying up already. You all look very scary. <laughs> shared decision making is a great thing, um, but you won't actually get it without a relationship of trust. Now there's common sense for you. Um, but it's slightly worrying that we're using this word now, like we can just share our decisions and we've not got a relationship. We've not actually earned our patient's trust, and I worry about this. So let's be clear, shared decision-making is a wonderful thing, but make sure that it arises out of concordance. Now, that's the academic first bit. Uh, this, when I read um, a lot of the should we or shouldn't we bother with concordance articles that have occurred over the last 10 to 15 years, Something is conspicuous by its absence, and that is mention of the fact that this is actually the law. Um, the term concordance originates with research carried out with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society in the 1990s, but the spirit of concordance was coined at the Ottawa 1986 UN Convention on Human Rights, which stipulated that it is the right of every individual to participate in their own care. So there is no option here. Terribly sorry, those of you who still wanted to wag the finger at your patients. Um, there is no option here. Our nation have signed up to this international treaty. Um, you know, so people who argue that compliance still has its place, terribly sorry, it doesn't. It's a partnership of equals, 
And it's all about patient-centred values and behaviours that uh, our treatment and our plan should begin with the concerns of the patient, take it into account. Um, and I'm sure I don't have to say any more uh, about that. But it's also about exploring the harm and benefits of each treatment option. And that requires good old-fashioned honesty. And I'll come back to that point uh, later on. It also means, and this has disappeared into the fog in this consumerist age in which we live, that patients have actual responsibilities. They have to be honest with us. They have to have the courage to come back uh, without any loss of face and say, well, look, this didn't work. I tried this. Um, you know, uh, my daughter was in a car accident last week, so this idea went out the window, I'm afraid, and so on and so forth. And what's really refreshing about uh, concordance is that it, look, it recognises consent for what it always has been a process and not an incident that is negotiated over time. Uh, now, I'm very interested in what Crib and Entwistle have got to say about this. They say that there are actually narrow and broad models of concordance. Excuse me. The f narrow model is basically evidence-based research taking into account the patient preference. A broad model of concordance is a much bigger deal. It is a relationship, an open-ended relationship of trust and honesty, where, as I've just said, the patient can come back and where a patient and practitioner are able to challenge each other, admitting that sometimes they've got it wrong without any loss of face. And decision-making capacity. Now, this one's a great excuse. If your patients, you don't think your patient's got decision-making capacity, we can go back to knowing best again. We don't actually have to bother about concordance. Well, I'm afraid the news on this is that we all lack decision-making capacity to some extent in our lives. When we are tired, when we're depressed, when we're drunk, um, when we are far too busy, when we're multitasking, and the fact of the matter is, it is the job of professionals to identify a time when a discussion about options can be had. Now, in mental health, particularly in Australia, there's a huge debate as to whether mentally ill people, people who are confused, people who have dementia, can be engaged in a concordant relationship. I believe they can, and I'm happy to answer questions about that afterwards. <clears throat> but decision-making capacity is for all of us a continuum. Patients will change their mind, they will freeze, they will have reason to regret, and sometimes they will change their treatment and their drugs for, or even stop taking them, arising out of sound and proper judgment. And it really is for all of us to accept that. And do you know what? If they get it wrong, that's their right. They have the right to get it wrong, make the wrong decision, and walk away. It's called autonomy. And we all have it most of the time. Now, I just want to get positive here um, because you read an awful lot of negative stuff about concordance. There's a great deal of heat generated about this, as if somehow, as professionals, we are disempowered. In fact, it's the opposite. Concordance is the solution. It's not the problem. Um, there is good research to show that the more service users are involved in decision-making about their treatment, the more their confidence in us as professionals grows. And um, the King's Fund Institute have found uh, that partnership working with patients and, and practitioners actually improves health outcomes and makes better use of resources. Now, I quickly want to have a romp around the spectrum of health and social care to demonstrate the evidence that exists that concordance really is a good idea. Starting with something that has been common practice in the Netherlands for many years, and that's drug consumption rooms, but actively being looked at by councils in Yorkshire and the south coast of England as I speak. This is somewhere, uh, an installation, where drug addicts can come and take drugs which would be illegal to take anywhere else in clean, fresh facilities, clean syringes, clean needles, and come into contact with social workers and other health workers who are able to help them get housing, help them get their lives back on course. Do you know what? Incidents of HIV, nosedives, 
uh, addiction nosedives, alcoholism nosedives. This is a stunning example of how public health initiatives following discussion with, what, with the people who matter about what they really want can actually save resources where many of the um, initiatives, such as ones go on, going on up and down the country with homeless people, can be a complete waste of money because it's not what these people want. We have to give them what they want. Very interesting research from a, a medical unit in Sweden by Berg and her team uh, on how encouraging patients to actively take responsibility for their own care, to argue with nurses, doctors, and other health professionals about their case, led to quicker discharges and better health outcomes. Quite remarkable um, results on that. But for me, um, one of the greatest testimonies towards concordance comes from the area of organ donation. Um, quite a large body of research on this, showing that when loved ones are approached for permission to um, to, to give permission for their dead loved one's organs to be used for transplant, um, they do not see, even if they carry a donor card themselves, they do not see this as a gift of life. They see it as a sacrifice. They see themselves as the guardian of their dead loved one's body against further disfigurement and indignity. And what has uh, been become clear is that where there has been a consistent relationship of trust and honesty between the health professionals treating their dead loved one and the relatives, which takes into account the separate needs of the relatives. People are much more likely to give permission. Now, the Simpkin research was a mixed methods study. And what was remarkable there was that of all the people who agreed to donation, of their dead loved one's organs, hardly anyone regretted it. Of the people who refused, 30% later regretted it. And you know, we can all have our theories about this. Let me share you, mine with you. That when service users, patients and their families are accustomed to handling power, they will use it much more responsibly and they will use it in a much more positive way. If this is the first time you've actually asked them about anything, they are likely not to cooperate with you. And I, I think that applies to uh, spectres of care well beyond um, organ donation. Those of you who are well used to treating diabetes will know that if you don't handle the trauma of diagnosis at the very beginning, you have no chance of, of sustaining any form of concordance uh, in, in the future. Uh, and which is why we, we now talk a lot about tailoring the treatment to the individual. And some follow-up research on, um, on the Medicines Partnership by Kriska found that when patients are invited in to the doctor's surgery, the clinic, or someone visits their home, wherever it may be, and they are asked about the lived experience of taking drugs, there are 30% more issues uncovered. Now that to me is huge. And it goes to um, support what Victoria was saying about hidden diagnosis and hidden problems and people not being listened to. Now, there are a number of antecedents to achieving concordance and indeed to sustaining it. Engagement has been defined as evidencing that you want to become involved, evidencing that you're interested. Listening, uh, that's an innovative strategy that's being tried anew around the world by health and social care professionals, which you actually hear and take on board what the patient has to say before you make a decision. Nothing too remarkable about it. Um, but uh, I'm very proud of the work we did in our early, early time at the University of Lincoln with first year student nurses, where we established a listening OSCE. And we won uh, praise around the county for the way our students listened more throughout the period of their studies. And I try and tell my students that forget diagnosis, forget all the advanced work. If you don't listen, then you'll never get it right. Valuing the patient expertise. This is important. And I think uh, Victoria's presentation once again was testimony to this, that patients, when they tell us what it's like, they actually know what they're talking about. They are experts in our own lives. And it does not bode well for us to stand there in a superior manner and say, this can't possibly be right because it's not what I've seen 
or it's not what I know. And this is very difficult for us. I think that if we are all honest as health professionals, it's been a real personal wrestle to give up power in this way and share power with the people uh, that we serve. Um, respecting patient values and beliefs, Brendan McCormick's done some interesting work on this. Uh, this isn't just about ticking boxes. Um, they don't, they're vegetarian, so we won't include this and, and so on. It's about getting under that patient's skin and understanding why they have the beliefs and values they have. Then we will have some chance uh, at establishing empathy. I'm going to come to empathy in a minute. The knowledge of the patient biography. What have they been through? What is this patient's story? What place does the clinical dish condition we are treating have in their lives. Empathy features in just about every professional ethical code around the world. You might be surprised to know, and I discovered this as part of my doctoral studies, that there is no clear de uh, consensual definition as to what empathy is, which is really dangerous because basically it means you can do what you like. Um, but, but I'm wondering how those of us like me, who have been fit and well most of our lives, can possibly empathise with someone like Victoria, with the suffering and the courage that she has had to show in the face of suffering, and the, difficult she, the difficulties she has had in, in, in actually recruiting the cooperation and, uh, of professionals such as she had. I, I, I'm certainly, unless it's touched our own lives in some way, I think this is almost impossible. So it's why that um, I have pioneered service use development in nursing in my own university, and why I have seen the, the, the prejudices and the assumptions that student nurses and indeed all of us make about people vanish as people with life-limiting and chronic long-term conditions have spoken about what it's like to live day in, day out with this condition and taking all this medication by various routes in various laborious ways. There also needs to be a willingness to share our expertise. Um, talking to some of you and listening to what you've had to say today and last night, uh, I get the impression um, this is a, a, a shared value here. But, you know, there is some disturbing research from Canada and Northern Ireland among community nurses who saw themselves as the expert and didn't want to share that expertise um, with, with the patient. And that's something I think we've got to ditch. Now, what are the determinants of non-concordance in tissue viability, care and treatment? Well, first of all, there's a huge variation between quantitative studies which show that non-concordance with treatment um, is, can be as high as 42%, and qualitative studies where we actually listen to people who've got the condition, where it shows that non-concordance is as high as 80%. Um, pain intensity is a big one, and I was interested to hear Una talk about her father-in-law, Douglas, earlier on, and talk about how he didn't want to make a fuss. And this is interesting because uh, this is a, 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 there's a, a generation differential here. Uh, people who are born between the two wars and just after the Second World War are not like the rest of us here. We are, tend to see life as an adventure, a journey where we maximize our potential and get the most out of life. People who are born between the two wars tend to see life as a survival course. Pain and illness and disease are things that they have to put up with as they get older. I think we know that isn't necessarily true, but it's how they see life, which explains why so many older patients endure pain before they request any analgesia. And it really is about talking to them about the importance of, of this. Um, hence the, the age factor. Wound depth, I think we heard earlier on from Peter about how, what a protracted process wound healing can be. And I think one has to be honest with patients from the beginning about the likelihood of this. That way we won't just achieve concordance, we'll sustain it because people won't have unrealistic expectations. Wound size uh, and, uh, is, is a very similar um, issue. 
about a person's strength, dexterity and mobility is surely inextricably tied up with their ability to manage hosiery and other applications. And it's about understanding all of this. But perhaps most of all, what does this condition mean for the patient? Is it the spoiler in their marriage? Is it what ended their career? Is it what forced them to move the from the house they loved? What is it about with them? How can we address the meaning, the personal meaning that this condition has for them? Have I jumped one? No. Good. Okay, now to the psychology. No, you can't go to sleep. Deletion is about how people process information. And there are clues here for those of us who want to be successful practitioners in tissue viability. Deletion is what, when we hear what we want to hear. Without deletion, we could not cope with all the information we absorb every day in life. So deletion is about hearing only what is useful to us. So when we're talking to patients, we jolly well make sure that we can convince them that this is important for them. Otherwise, in one ear out the other. And it's not because they're stupid, it's because they've made their mind up that this is of no use to them. Distortion is when we change reality and warp it to suit our own values. We see, hear, and experience what we want to hear and see experience, not what we actually hear and experience. And we gen generalization is when we say all district nurses are rubbish. It's a, it's a, it's a, a sweeping statement making global generalizations born from one, two, or three experiences. But you know what? We really have to take these experiences on board and earn patients' respect anew. Try and persuade them why it's going to be different this time. What are the techniques? What are the applications? What are the methods that are changing? And listening is a big part of that too. So we, dis we delete, distort, and generalize on the basis of our values, beliefs, memories, and decisions. And I think you can all probably tell me more than I can tell you about the indignity, the trauma, the anxiety, and the pain that accompanies many problems connected with uh, peripheral vascular disease and tissue viability. And it really, um, for those in the front line, it calls in what is a pretty service-driven service these days to actually individualize care and to, um, to give opportunity. Ilya Katyalio from Finland that I cited earlier talked about the importance of conversation and discussion with patients about how their memories affect their views now. Some psychologists actually say that the present, what happens in the present, has very little to do with the decisions we make in the present, much more to do with the, the emotions and the memories that we carry from past, particularly unpleasant ones, from, from the past as we get older. So patients have seven core emotional needs. They need certainty. What's the out, what are the outcomes going to be here and what are the care pathways? What are we going to try? Where are we going to go with this? And where do we want to end up? And if we don't end up there, this is what we will have to do instead. And that last bit's quite important. Otherwise, people will lose faith and give up. Variety, offering treatment options. I think this is where the leg matters uh, website, which I got very excited about for my, on my students' behalf, matters because we're talking colours, we're co talking different uh, applications, and uh, we are talking um, uh, below and above knee uh, applications. It may also may be that in the case of obesity, rheumatoid arthritis, other clinical conditions that cause uh, joints to be swollen or misshapen, uh, that we need to have bespoke applications. Um, what is life like for this patient? How can we help them stay alive socially? Where are their friends? Where do they want to go? Where do they need to be? Um, and it's about uh, making it significant for them, keeping the motivation through involvement in clinical decision making, helping the patient to see the options at each stage. Um, helping patients in such a, a long-term condition, helping patients to see progress. You can do this through conversation, photographs, diaries, progress charts, any way you want, but let them see where they are now compared to where they were before so they don't get disheartened 
with where they thought they'd be. And working through partnership, and I've heard, delighted to hear, I've heard this all morning, multidisciplinary working, not making all the decisions on our own. And um, you know what? We will keep our patients' faith and their trust if we keep involving them and let them know that this isn't lip service, that their contribution is actually valued. I need to know what you're thinking now so that we can move ahead. So, according to Irene Anderson, there are 10 points for concordance in, in tissue viability. Treat the pain proactively. Persuade your patient that they must take analgesia uh, proact proactively and preempt pain. Consider patient capacity and experience. Um, and this is about being realistic. Compromise can be good if we get some progress out of it. It may not fit the nice guidelines, but hey, progress is progress. Don't try to do everything at once. Get the fit right, the application. Um, patients have busy lives, complex lives, chaotic lives even. So reminders, diaries, encouragement. Clinical skill. Make sure you attend your Tissue Viability Society conference and update yourself. And see with fresh eyes. What core... I think... Um, uh, Victoria, again, was a good example of this. What are the comorbidities here? What else is going on? What colleagues do we know that we can trust? Um, make sure, leg ulcer clubs are great things, but make sure they're timed at the same time as the bus services, the train services, and if your patients can't take advantage of them, what else can you do about it? And how else can they meet, not just other people with the same conditions, but the people they used to have the friends they used to have. What, are, what is out there? The big society, if you excuse my French. Um, travel difficulties, I mentioned. The location, the timing, the structure of clinics. Keep being with them in their situation. Go home. Think about what it must be like to be in their situation. Communicate effectively and imaginatively. Um, Arian Anderson draws a distinction between aggravated and mitigated directives. Aggravated directives are, you must try this, I need you to do this. Mitigated directives uh, are, are, are saying, how do you feel about trying this? What are your views? How do you, would it work, do you think, if we move forward in this direction? And I think this last bit from Price is common sense. Thank you very much for your attention.